Yes, there he is. Welcome, Joost. Welcome to TOMCS. Is that is that really William Camilleri next to you? Yes, yes, yes. We thought for this wow. specific occasion we need multi support. Yes, yes. Very good. Very good. Yeah. So tell us, what, are, what do you have? So welcome. So we are here in uh, room 22 with a very exciting case. Uh, we have a full team, as mentioned already, William Camilleri from Malta, one of our fellows. Hi. We have Alice, Marlene, Peter and uh, Stefan to support us. And we have a patient, which is a 80-year-old gentleman. And maybe we can uh, briefly show you the, uh, the slides to uh, illustrate the, uh, the history of the patient and the, uh, the stuff that we are uh, up against. So, William. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, so this is an 80-year-old male uh, with a history of uh, COPD, Gold 1. Um, in 2000, she was diagnosed with uh, bladder CA. In uh, 20 December, he had uh, COVID pneumonia. And he's a known case of uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, 60 millimeter, treated with EVAR. Uh, regarding his cardiac history, he's a known case of atrial fibrillation, had a PCI to his LAD in 2014. In 2015, we presented to, with us to, to with uh, unstable angina, and he had, a, he had a cabbage done with the Lima to the LAD and the SVG to OM and the RDP. In 2023, he was admitted here with heart failure um, and uh, diagnosed with moderate to severe AS. And in 2023 of December, uh, admitted with heart failure. Next slide, please. Um, he has an active lifestyle, and, but he's currently admitted with, with heart failure. Stable blood pressure, 121 and 73. Um, labs are fine. Crash slightly elevated creatinine of 100 with an EGFR of uh, 61. Hemoglobin is 9.5. Next slide, please. ECG shows uh, LVH with strain with widespread uh, ST depressions. Next slide, please. We can see here on the echo, there is a moderately reduced uh, ejection fraction um, with uh, MR, mild MR and AR on the parasternal long axis. Next slide, please. Uh, severe biatrial dilatation with, as we said, moderately uh, reduced ejection fraction. Next slide, please. Uh, we can see the aortic regurgitation here, and the patient also is known to have moderate uh, aortic stenosis with a Vmax here of uh, three meters per second. Next slide, please. Um, so this is the coronary angiogram from the referring center. Uh, we can see that there is uh, heavily calcified proximal LAD of main disease and CERC. Next slide, please. Um, this is the attempt at finding the, uh, the lima on the previous, but um, it was uh, not successful. Next slide, please. Um, the RCA is uh, patent, and we can see the SVG is patent as well. Next slide, please. So the CT scan. Yeah, so th that, that was actually the, the, the status of the patient when he was referred to us uh, two days ago. So now the second admission with heart failure in, in two months' time. Uh, obviously, with uh, multiple comorbidities, a reduced LV function, uh, moderate, at least moderate uh, AS based on the uh, on the echo, and significant coronary artery disease with a lima that was not just not found, but basically was non-existing. Uh, with that, we we took over the patient for for screening here, and he appeared to be uh, in a in a relatively okayish performance scale. He was, was wandering around just before admission. Uh, he was, was completely uh, independent and home. And um, we made a CT scan to get a bit of a better impression on his aortic stenosis, as well as on his vascular status, uh, with the uh, aim to, to, to explore the options for a, a high-risk PCI. So this was the, uh, the aortic valve, so Agatson score of two, uh, 1,200 with the gradient of less than three meters. Uh, yeah, with that, we, we, we classified that to be uh, uh, at max uh, moderate. And if you go to the next slide, you can see the, uh, the uh, peripheral uh, vasculature with the status post EVAR, uh, two stands uh, extending into its, uh, its external iliac, but actually puncture sites that were uh, relatively okay uh, with that, next slide, we took the patient to the heart team and uh, uh, agreed uh, that this patient was clearly inoperable and we opted for a high-risk uh, PCI of his LAD, so left main to LAD, under uh, Impella CP support and due to his extensive femoral disease, a, uh, a radial approach for his, uh, his, his coronaries uh, in order to have a little bit better maneuverability. Um, 
and a conservative approach with respect to his uh, aortic stenosis. So with that, I think we'll stop for now and maybe uh, open the case for discussion. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe the first question to Divaka, is this a patient that would be eligible for the CHIP uh, BSIS trial? Um, so I, I, I'm afraid I didn't okay. see the left anatomy uh, very well. Um, so in, in, in order to be in CHIP BSIS 2, you've got to have severe the impairment uh, and EF less than 35 percent. Yeah. Um, and also the planned intervention needs Fact. to finally involve the left main calcium modification in multiple multiple vessels. Now, from what your description, I, I didn't catch the, the actual image. It seems like the, the coronary jeopardy and the complexity is high enough. So I, I think, yes, probably. But I, I, I'll, I'll wait okay. to see the the left-sided okay. views again. Then uh, yeah. then the, the question so, for, for Valeria, when you when you would consider a patient like this, is uh, is mechanical circulatory support on your mind now? Or, or do you would you try to attempt without any support, uh, given the fact that the patient was still wandering around and, and uh, yeah? No, I think that's an important point. I mean, that's a, a stable patient, so we have all the time to plan the procedure and offer this patient the uh, the best quality of treatment. So meaning that if we perform the procedure under a support device, MCS support device, then we can really achieve the best result, optimize the procedure, use all the debulking techniques that we want and and not be afraid of any prolonged ischemia or repetitive ischemia. I think that's uh, that's the main point. Yeah. Holger, what is, what is your take? Because there is no randomized controlled uh, data to scrutinize our practice in this regard. Would you, would you dare to attack this lesion without any kind of mechanical support? Yeah, honestly, yes. Um, maybe I have missed it. So I, I, uh, the ejection fraction was 40%. Yeah, forty. Yeah. So forty. So this would, according to the Vaca's inclusion criteria, even not be a pa um, patient being eligible for chip visa straight. I think this is correct. What you could do that. Um, six and six and, and down. Honestly, yeah. um, also <clears throat> um, this has been also presented differently before. Um, the <clears throat> initial Protect Two trial did not show a benefit um, on the 30-day primary study endpoint. And it was stopped for futility. This is also, if we are really talking about evidence, it was stopped for futility by the data safety monitoring board. And all hard endpoints, this is what I use in the gas, myocardial infarction, maybe also stroke, were also numerically not in favor for the impeller device. So <clears throat> yeah. this is at least how I interpret um, evidence, and that's the reason why in this case probably I would not do it. I would have it in place in case of an emergency, but not do it in on a routine basis. Yeah. So my my personal take is that uh, we are we are really treating patients now beyond Protec two. We are applying calcium modification techniques that really may destabilize um, a patient's hemodynamics. And then yeah, in order to prevent that, uh, that would be the argumentation that I would have to use uh, an impella support. Uh, you also, what, what is your take on this? Would you try uh, what you're doing now uh, without support and basically help us through your yeah, strategy six, now? Six. Yeah, so I think two, two comments, at least from my side, I, I fully agree with everything has, that has been said. There is a clear lack of, of, of um, unquestionable evidence in favor of using uh, mechanical circulatory support in a broader spectrum of patients. Um, that said, this patient was admitted twice with heart failure. So that tells me that his reserves, so let's just say to, to survive or to, to overcome these, these episodes, even without me doing any complex PCI stuff, are limited. Um, so in that perspective, four, we, uh, we decided to go for an Impella CP uh, supported PCI um, and, uh, and treat this LAD. Obviously, uh, whether or not we would have needed the, uh, the Impella is something that uh, sometimes we never know and sometimes we only know during the case. 
Um, backup, you know, is a feasible strategy, but also a strategy that is not without risks. Uh, if you're in the heat of the moment, are in need of putting in an impeller in somebody with a aortic stenosis, who is who's at least uh, frail, 80 years old, and has a significant vascular disease, I, I, I don't think that would be the, uh, at least not that would, that was not my preferred uh, route in this in this patient. So maybe we can uh, take you through the, uh, the angios to show you what we've done so far for. Or, Akash, maybe we can uh, show the angels. Yeah. Wait, let me quickly finish this and we'll take you through. So what we did, uh, basically, so we made a uh, six French uh, uh, radial artery axis quite smooth. We uh, put in the uh, the sheet and the uh, six French sheet in the uh, in the femoral. Um, we used two proglides. Uh, the uh, wires actually uh, crossed quite easily. Easily, we used the uh, impeller wire to uh, uh, go with the big sheet, then uh, cross the valve with the AL2, and then. Um, Measured the pressures. His LVEDP was eight. Uh, so that is, uh, yeah, that could have been an argument not to use a device. Uh, but instead, we gave 250 cc's of fluid in order to uh, to increase that a little bit to uh, to avoid any um, any suction alarms on the impella. Final time, and. Um, yeah, we, we put in the impella without any uh, without any issues, and then we started to uh, to wire the LED. Uh, we're currently doing some shock waving, as you see. Um, that has been done now. Empty. And maybe now we can show you the angio. So if we go to the first angio, or maybe uh, Alisa can uh, show you maybe for, uh, previous one. So this was the big sheet, so we took the long impeller sheet uh, in order to uh, accommodate the, uh, the impeller without any issues through this uh, uh, long segment of, of stented iliacs and uh, uh, aortic tissue. Um, we put in the impeller and um, then wired the left main and took some shots. So here is the anatomy. You can clearly appreciate the uh, significant amount of calcium and tortuosity in the osteoproximal part of the LAD. Serg uh, is uh, partly occluded uh, with the patent uh, vein graft and the right uh, RDP was also occluded with a also patent vein graft. So with that, we only have a uh, left main LAD. And here, I think this is the best image you can clearly appreciate the enormous chunks of calcium in the uh, osteo-LAD and distal left main, at least angiographically. And then we have a second problem, which is the LAD immediately after the bifurcation with a big diagonal branch. Um, so we wired that with a uh, whisper wire to see how that went. Next image. Um, and I wanted to take an IVUS, but as you can see and maybe already anticipated, this IVUS did not cross. So we anticipated already to, uh, to use a uh, rotor blader and uh, eventually that's what we did. So we um, took a micro catheter and then this, that's maybe quite interesting to mention. So we have this rotor drive wire now, which is actually, it's actually the second time I'm using it. This is the second case today with the wire and it's, it's, it's absolutely better in terms of maneuverability as compared to the previous wire. So with that, we were able with the micro catheter only in proximal part of the LED to exchange the whisper for the uh, uh, rotor wire, the rotor drive. The only thing we couldn't cross into the LED, but put the wire in this, uh, this actually almost larger diagonal branch, but we thought that was okay for now to, uh, to do the rotor of the proximal part. So that we did. Rhoda went uh, uneventful, a couple of runs. This is a 125 burr. Next. Next. Here we took a 3 balloon to pre dilate a little bit. 3 non compliant balloon. And then we made an IVIS. Maybe we can uh, show you the IVIS. So that's really our routine practice. If there's a lot of calcium, I think IVIS or at least any type of imaging is the uh, the way forward to uh, to assess uh, how severe the calcifications are, how extensive they are, uh, what are their nodules, what are their concentric calcifications. And this is the pullback starting in the mid part of the LED. You can see the lumen is quite big and stop the IVIS. Here you can see the effect of the balloon and between five and nine o'clock you see a nice hematoma being the result of the uh, rhoda and, and likely more likely the non-compliant balloon play. The hematoma is still clearly visible. We're in the right loom and there's a dissection at seven o'clock. 
Mm. Exactly at the edge of the calcified nodule, which is what you expect. That's where the artery ruptures. And that's where we measured an MLA, which was 2.2, after rota and non-compliant balloons. Life is catheter. And that's where we thought, you know, <laughs> we are not really happy what, uh, with, with, with what we've done. So there's a need for uh, perhaps a more aggressive lesion preparation. And that's why we opted to, uh, to take a uh, shockwave. But that's maybe also something to uh, discuss in the panel. You know, I, I like uh, this extensive um, calcium modification and also the interrogation of the lesion. So it will help you decide what kind of um, uh, technology uh, might suit best for this patient. And make no mistake, if you start rotablating and using shockwave balloons, um, then you will affect the ventricle as yeah. you're doing that, Start right? So rotablation is associated with uh, embolization of calcific debris, can result in no reflow. And shockwave, every time you, in, you keep a balloon inflated in this uh, particular situation in the left main for 10 seconds in a row, that might be enough to trigger like a, a, a negative spiral and uh, that might help you lose the patient. And obviously these kind of techniques were not um, used in, for instance, PROTEC2. So we don't have any randomized control data that enrolled patients with this kind of uh, extensive calcific disease. Um, okay, length meter, yeah. So, so what you're doing now, Jost, is uh, you're doing an IVIS after the shockwave, yeah, right? Yeah, IVIS after the shockwave. And then we see two things. One is that the hematoma is uh, extending, actually, in the mid part of the LED. You really you see a 360-degree hematoma now. If you go more proximal, Peter, go, go, go. Yeah, there you see it. You see that? Mm -hmm. See this big ring yeah. of, uh, of blood? But more importantly to me is that the shockwave didn't do that much. If you go to the side of the MLA, you can see that the chunks of calcium are still there. It's maybe a bit, a bit better, a bit better. If you yeah, go to the right, better. yeah, but here, this, this was the side, but it's fractured. So you see there, yeah. there's no 360 degrees of calcium. So I think this is the time to size a stand. So if you go distal, so we start by finding a healthy segment distally. At six millimeter was the distal reference, I would say, distal to the hematoma, at least for now. Yeah, around there, perfect. Put the bookmark or trace assist. Yeah, okay, so this is a trio vessel. And now you need to decide one stand to go to the ostium, or do we take two stands? But there's a very short left main, virtually no left main. And we have Zion stands, which you can easily post dilate to 4.0. Ah, but if you go to B1, Peter, and measure media to media, I think we can take a 3.5. Let's take a 3.5, that is fine. Uh, and then if you go to B2, is B2 at the ostium of the left main? Yeah, there is the order. So that's 28 millimeters. Okay, I think that's... Uh, that sounds like a strategy to me. So can I have a 3.5 stand? In the meantime, uh, like Jos, the question for Holger. Holger, do you also take time to interrogate these lesions with IVUS and, and to respect all the steps? Or are you more quick and dirty? Let's get it over with without advanced hey, imaging. Depends on the lesion um, complexity, honestly. Yeah, probably in this case, I at least I probably would have not used IVUS in between. Maybe I would have used IVUS just at the beginning and at the end to control the PCI result. Um, <clears throat> but this is um, always depending on the lesion morphology. Yeah. What about you, Divaka? Is, the, is um, imaging also part of the trial yeah. in the UK or is it for operator's discretion? <clears throat> it's operator discretion, but uh, there, there is a lot of imaging being done virtually in all cases where the calcium modification is what's got them in. So I, I would always image up front, but like Holger, whether we I go back and look at it after shock waving or whether we uh, you know, go on to stenting depends on how the Three, five, behave, and okay. dynamics are okay and so on. Sometimes you just have to get on with it and don't do all of the IVUS runs, but definitely up front at the beginning. So, yeah. So Valeria, uh, Joost is, uh, is uh, using multiple uh, calcium preparation technology. Uh, do you feel that this, are you also using that, um, like adding 
are you applying Rota Rota Shock, for instance, uh, as you as you're seeing here? Well, I mean, that's uh, that's the uh, added value of uh, having multiple rounds of of IBUS, and uh, again, we want to optimize the procedure. We'll, so we want to confirm that. Uh, uh, we did have, uh, we did achieve some calcium modification. Uh, so the strategy, uh, the combined uh, rota shock, that's uh, something. And of course, we have to uh, to also uh, acknowledge that the calcified nodule sometimes is uh, is not anyhow uh, treatable with any of these debulking technique. Uh, but uh, I think, yeah, a rota shock uh, as well as rota cut. I think this combination of multiple debulking techniques can also like combine, um, uh, you know, positive effects of, of all of these devices. But I do, I, I do stand for, for um, checking the calcium modification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Your your wire is still in the diagonal, right? When are you rewired? We rewired ah, okay. after the uh, uh, rota. We ballooned, um, and then we put the uh, to exchange the rota drive wire. We put the over the wire balloon back in the mid part of the LED, and then I took a whisper wire, and with a little bit of uh, trial and error, we managed to get into the uh, LED. Okay. Oh, good, good, good. No. And so the plan is now to stay on the Austin the was main into the distal LED. Well, we, we, we've started with the proximal part and then uh, we'll take it from there. I wanted to secure the proximal part now with the hematoma. Mm -hmm. So we just put in a uh, 3.5 Zion stand. So this, this balloon flies through and that's always a very good sign. That usually tells me that there's no extensive under expansion or or flying struts in, in the lumen because of the nodules. Cool. So this is a three five non compliant balloon. Well. Post dilate. Routinely do that. And twenty. And 20. what's happening now in terms of support, Down. mechanical support? How much support do you get? So the impeller runs without any issues at three mil, uh, three liters per minute. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we can show the impeller screen because this is maybe something that is interesting to discuss. So the impeller went in quite smoothly. Uh, you can see. I think it's it's positioned well. It's it's running three liters per minute without any issues. But we had a issue with the flush system. So um, we pulled a little bit on the impella and we, we, we watched for kinks in the system go but we were not able to solve the problem so the question now is what right. is causing the uh, pressures errors uh, the pressure errors in the uh, flushing system so we exchanged or changed uh, 20 and down the flush system um, but unfortunately that was not able to solve the issue um, so as far as we know, there can be kinks in the catheter, but it usually doesn't, at least in my perspective, doesn't fit with the fact that it runs without issues three liter per minute go. Um, or there is a thrombus at the catheter, which is also a little bit awkward because the ACT was continuously above uh, 250 and the last ACT was even 300. So I think interesting to discuss and, and to get your perspectives on what, yeah, down, what may be causing this. Well, the, my my major observation is that you're not in the apex with the tip of your catheter, and you seem to be interacting with the papillary muscle. So, if you would go to an RAO view, you would you you probably will see that. Yeah, so this is the LAO. Yeah, but that's a short axis, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And here we have the and RAO. You yeah. You yeah. are interacting with the papillary muscle. Yeah. So the tip of your impella needs to be where your wire is. But, you know, for the time being, I would leave that behind, leave it at yeah. this, but this is probably the explanation. So don't bother, you have good enough yeah. support. And yeah. uh, if you would start manipulating now, you are at risk of losing your impeller. Yeah, that is exactly what I was thinking. That is Nick, exactly can I, if we have time, can I ask just for yes. everyone? Holger, go. Meek. go ahead, Holger. Uh, you have a, or Holger or oh, Divaka. Sorry. Let's first Divaka, okay. Yeah, you made a really nice point about uh, making sure you don't interact with the papillary muscle. So, what do you normally do when you when you insert it? Do you make sure your O18 runs freely, and you do you check it in two views? Uh, I don't check it in two views uh, systematically, but I I do like the RAO view to make sure that I that I'm in the apex. That is what I typically do. Yeah, Holger, you also had a question. 
Yeah, I have a question to to Joost. Um, did you at any time see that you lost positivity or maybe had impaired positivity in the situation? Because this is probably the only thing what is telling you if you really need um, the impeller device in this situation. Yeah, no, that's absolutely correct. Um, we started with a blood pressure of 90 over 60. And we're now continuously, even during the rotor blader or the long shockwave balloon inclusions at 120 over 80. So that's what I can tell you. But there were no episodes in which we, which we really lost positivity thus far. But you know, you, there, there is a way of uh, exploring this. Eh? So I, I know that you typically yeah, keep your non-compliant balloons uh, inflated for 10 seconds or longer. So as you will do that in a second, why don't we the, then focus on yeah. the on the impeller Feel signal to see whether you see that Feel the pulse pressure is uh, and the pulse volatility is going down. Yeah, we can check. So we just did a knife is to check. The stand is really nice, uh, nicely expanded. Oh, see, okay. it's huge. Maybe you can show the eyes there. Uh, like Edge looks fine. We covered the hematoma. Yeah, this looks perfect. You can already see on the longitudinal view, everything looks fine. I'm one millimeter in the aorta, which uh, it's perfectly fine for now. We're going to post that a little bit. The awesome, yeah, 415. And the Aquiforce mag ook open. So when you do that, when you do the post dilatation of the ostium of the left main, yeah. keep the balloon inflated for 10 seconds and then let's move to the, yeah. to the impeller. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll do that. Patient, by the way, is doing fine. And the left good. main is a little bit unclear. Probably it would be more interesting to see it in the LED because this is the target vision. Also for the Say audience. again, uh, Holger. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Holger, your comment again? Yes, yeah, so for sure, if you ins um, inflate the balloon in the left main, bearing the 80% of the left ventricular myocardium, probably we should yeah. more focus on the LED because in the situation, we would more know if there is some kind of 14, impairment 14. in the situation. Yeah. Show the impeller. Or the hemodynamics. There is a pain impeller pain and the hemodynamics. The OM, isn't there? Oh, so. okay. Yeah. Okay, so these are the hemodynamics with the balloon inflated in the left main. But now the pulsatility of the of the impeller. Yeah, I mean, apparently we cannot uh, we cannot show that to you. But thus far, everything uh, looks fine. Yeah, nothing happening. Nothing happening. Okay, done. Good, Aquiforce. Mm -hmm. Table. Yeah. But okay. again, I mean, all these complex stuff, the, 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 the IVIS to check for the stand, to check for the hematomas, to make sure you're good. I mean, we used, by now, we use 25 cc's of contrast. Um, I would be much more reluctant to do that and to work like this without Impella. But yeah, I think that's uh, it's maybe the luxury of uh, the Western world in which we, where we have the opportunity to do it. Yeah, but, but I think this is this is a fair point. Huh? Um, we are experienced uh, MCS users, and if you would only use a mechanical support on a Blue Monday when really the the patient is almost dying, yes, <laughs> then then obviously yeah. you will find it uh, difficult to 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 impl implement mechanical circulatory support. And yeah, well, you know, once it's there, you're happy that it is there, and uh, at the same time. Uh, it is. It, it's not always easy to identify okay. when and, the uh, mechanical circuitry support is, is helping you during the procedure. That's why it is running in the background. That's the whole principle, obviously. Difficult to demonstrate that in randomized studies. I agree with that. But you know, there are there is this uh, Protect Four uh, ongoing in the United States, and and also I think uh, Chip Bices that uh, will uh, hopefully give us some answers there. Yeah. So in the meantime, we're trying to cross the distal LED. Um, but when you, yeah, it, so yours, because you only gave 25 cc's yeah, of contrast. Yeah, obviously, I'll make an angel. Yes, exactly. I'll make it. I, th I heard you thinking, mm -hmm. we need an angel. All right, here we go. Okay. Nice. Now, that looks already much better. Yes. Just that wire out the septal and then we're good. <laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, 
Okie doke. There you go. <laughs> okay, so I took a Aquiforce, which was maybe a little bit opportunistic. Now I took a 1.0, what is this, a Sapphire? Yeah. Uh, to see if we can uh, cross the DISA LED. Otherwise, I mean, for the, for the, record, for the panel. You didn't throw it uh, there, eh? No, 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 mm -hmm. no, I did not. I did not. No. Yeah, I thought about it, but as, as I couldn't get the rotor wire in, because there's a very nasty bend in the LED just after the diagonal. Is your plan to okay. balloon and then Ivers the, the distal LED also? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, go. So this balloon is crossing, that's nice. So we go to 18. 18. Yeah, and down. Yeah, lousy. 18. And down. But this looks promising, yeah? yeah? Go. Very good. 18. Yeah, with res respect to positioning of 18. the impella, I mean, we're so used when we're doing tavis to get the wire nicely in the apex, but I mean, I, I, I sometimes find this more difficult with the uh, down, with the uh, with a very floppy uh, 18 uh, wire we used to position the uh, the impella, but, but maybe some comments from the panel. Yeah, so that's why I, I really insist on getting the, the, the pigtail itself in the apex. Obviously, if you, 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 you can also have the pigtail in the middle of the ventricle and then, or, or just beyond uh, the LVOT, and then obviously that O18 wire may, uh, may find, it, find its way in directions that you don't want to have it. But once your pigtail, sh your pigtail shape itself is in the yeah. apex, yeah, then... The wire is there. Yeah, yeah I think that's a, that's a fair point and maybe a very important take-home message. Yeah. Because repositioning the devices, as you mentioned, is uh, is, is difficult. Yeah, it's not so. going to happen. But this is a, this scenario you don't want to have in the ICU. You know, in 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 the cat lab, it's not a problem. Worst case scenario, you will try to um, reposition it, and and if that doesn't work, you will have to. Uh, recross the aortic valve and, and, and take out a new and put in a new pump. But that's not uh, often not possible in an ICU setting with a patient that is completely unstable. So there uh, I really feel that yeah, you need all, all attention to have a proper positioning from the get-go. Yeah. But everything is going smooth here. So uh, this is now the the 225 or the IVIS? No, I took the 225. No, I don't think there's a lot of sense in using IVIS now, in my perspective. If the balloon doesn't cross, it's usually not a good sign. But I have to admit, this is EBU35 because of the osteo lesion. That's not giving me all the support I want. So let's take a guideliner and then uh, I'm sure we will manage. Yeah, come on. Yeah, so Valeria, would you now be concerned to re-enter with, uh, with Rota because you obviously stented the proximal uh, segments? Would that be a concern to you? Um, well, I mean, this is, uh, we're talking about uh, um, a stent, a three and a half stent post dilated with a 4 balloon. And if we take the, uh, like we start with a, with the smallest bar, probably not. But honestly, I do agree with the with your strategy. I mean, it's a tortoise uh, vessel. It's a, a distal LED. Um, I mean, I would approach the distal part with either shock or a cutting balloon with like uh, control and, and a small incision of calcium. And I think it will probably make the job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now an additional hurdle to overcome is the stent that is protruding a little bit in the left main. And uh, I think it is preventing the guideliner to enter uh, the left coronary at this point. So it's a good idea to use uh, a balloon now yeah. to track the guideliner down. Yeah. 
And I'm sure that once you once you have the guide liner in the proximal LED, you will have much more support to get your balloon across that lesion too. Yeah. Yeah, but with respect to Valera's point, I mean, this tortuosity in the LED made me a bit reluctant to uh, be very aggressive with the rotor here in the distal LED. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Specifically also with all the disease proximally. Yeah, plaza. And it might be a fairly small caliber vessel beyond that diagonal. Yeah, absolutely. Diagonal. Absolutely. Yeah, the diagonal is even bigger than, I mean, we could even have decided to leave this, right? Yeah. Other people would have left it, not not treated. Hmm. Huh. I think I would have a good runoff in the diagonal. If the runoff was compromised, I'd let you obliged to treat yeah. it. But this yeah. probably was a case where we could have left it. But yeah, plaza. Yeah. And. This, this is not something I would routinely do to start the proximal part first, but I think in this case, we're a little bit... Well done. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Very good. Gaat het goed, meneer? Ja, hoor. Oh, A little bit of pain in his left leg. Probably the long sheet is compromising the carina and the aorta, bifurcation. But he's doing fine. Um, uh, you also also mentioned your radial access in principle, if the blood vessels would allow it you would uh, leverage the impella sheet to introduce a guiding catheter, correct? Yes, that's correct. Ah, come on. Good so. Almost there. <sighs> But not completely. No, but now you can even anchor, eh? and then you can get deeper with the uh, yeah. guide liner. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, okay, let's do that. Blasen? 18. 18. Well, that's uh, opening up quite nicely. Mm -hmm. yeah, down. There you go. Okay, Forrest. Yeah, there we are. Okay, <laughs> go. One, yeah, and down. Good so. So, Ivis or stand? I would stand it. To yeah, be yeah. Honest. that's yeah. what I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. Good. But I yeah. would have kept my Last guide liner. Yeah, that was the plan, but <laughs> <laughs> that was well. not really deliberately that I pulled it back. Let's try to get it in. Uh, that might have added 15 minutes to the procedure. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, okay, but not completely. Okay, good. Can I see the uh, RSO film or the cranial film down again? Let's check the length of the stand. Ah, this is smaller. Yeah. Poof. Let's take a 225, 23 stand. And are you gonna stand across the, that bifurcation? What I want to do is to make a small angle in the RSO projection. But that's where the uh, I understand why um, you wanted to get on with stenting rather than ibis. But I, the reason I suggested ibis was to try and identify where, what our landing zone should be. Yeah. What, ah. Let's just do the ibis here. We have uh, 
Okay, flush the arms. Yeah. Okay, now. I'd be surprised if there is a zone without disease. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> but the interesting part to me is to see, are we going to go into the carina or proximal or distal to the bifurcation? Yeah, give me some more length of the arms, please. And, uh, a question to the operators and the panel. If it is that the disease comes back to the bifurcation, would anyone consider a DCB? Uh, yeah, <laughs> interesting uh, question. Whoa, this is extremely small. Huh? Yeah, store and start pullback. I, I I like the idea of the DCB, honestly. It's less than 2.0 with a huge chunk of calcium. And it will mean you don't put a stent strut across the diagonal as well. Uh, any any support for the DCB? Uh, there, oh. poof. That's the bifurcation. So we can stand just up until the level of the bifurcation. That's nice. Okay, stop bar. Okay. Voila, thank you. So are you gonna, do you plan to leave a gap then between your current stand and then the stand that you're gonna... Oh yeah, that, that will be at least 20, 30 millimeter gap. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, no, that's fine. That's totally fine. Okay, so go to the ostium of the LAD, distal to the carina. Yeah, that's perfect. Keep it there. Bookmark or trace assist and then uh, we go distal to find a spot to put a stand or a balloon. Yeah, this is ending nowhere. You see, this nodule is not going to move. No, yeah, but it's dissected, eh? Uh, I'm not so sure it's dissected. You see here, it's healthy. Yeah, yeah. If, if you go a couple of millimeters more proximal, you enter a dissection, I think. Uh, it's difficult to see. You see yeah. here, uh, this is a nodule. Uh, play, you can play. Difficult. You cannot look behind the calcium. There may be something yeah, there at, uh, at four. I would cover that. To be okay, honest. good. Let's uh, go distally. We'll take a 225, a bit more distal. When it became but normal, I'm not sure the stand will cross, but let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Let's take a two to five up until there. Length, bookmark, and length. 20, 22 or something, Stefan. 225, 22 stand. 23. Perfect. See, Stefan doesn't need the Ivis. <laughs> he gets you the right size instantaneously. <laughs> <laughs> Took us 10 minutes. But at least we're sure now that we don't want to cover the bifurcation. Nice, 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 nice. Okay, good test. Uh, yeah, okay, perfect. Yeah, plaats maar. Twelve. Yeah. Twelve. Yeah, and down, 225. Oh. Aquiforce. Nee, die we hebben is goed. Stefan, gaat het goed, maar meneer? Kijk nou. Blauw kijk voor ons. Wat ik wel mag doen, is het beetje gewoon recht laten liggen. Dan bijvoorbeeld in de voet. Yeah.
De nieuwe Happy Force. Het is op plaats. Ja. Ik ga we nu nog even nablaan aan zo'n goed tegen de wand aan te duwen. Ja, ja. Oké. Okay. Wow. Post daar later en uh, ik hoop er dan. Ja. Wait a second, but connecting. Okay, so the, the, the plan now is to post dilate if possible. Yeah. 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 Are you start, uh, you can start weaning the impella, right? Yeah, we can. Yeah, you can put the impella to uh, P6 or something. Yeah, yeah vacuum. So and as you are turning down the impella, you will see that the support obviously goes down and then You pay 18, attention 18, to the 18. hemodynamics. Make sure that your mean arterial pressure yeah. remains in the Torque same down. No. magnitude. If that is the case, you can continue with your uh, yeah. weaning trial. 18. 18. Because obviously you, your, you plan to take out the no. impella after yes. the procedure. Yes, yeah? Yeah. yes. Does, um, do any of you use yeah. a rice heart to help with weaning in patients who are more dependent? Oh. 18, down. I Sore. think so. I think it makes, a, it makes a lot of sense to have a right heart cath in that regard. Um, I will say I don't do it systematically. I, I typically will do an LVDP up front. Um, and from time to time, uh, because I also have a guiding catheter, I try to cross the aortic valve with the guiding catheter to measure the LVDP when I'm in doubt uh, whether the patient will, uh, okay. Ready for an angel? will yeah. be able to uh, successful well. complete, uh, successfully complete the reeling. Ah. Oh, that's good. Nice. Yes. So that's it. We'll I stop would, here. Yes. All right. I think that's it. I'm going to take out the impella. I'm happy. <laughs> Good. Okay, voila. So Let's take we, an ACT. Yeah, and can we also uh, look at the hemodynamics? Yeah, of course. There you go. So that looks very favorable. Stay spike. Mean arterial pressure is above 90. It ziet er goed uit, man. It's better klaar. So obviously it was a protected left main LAD with a patent venous bypass. Um, so we were not anticipating a difficult weaning trajectory. As a matter of fact, Holger would not have even inserted a, an impella. So now it's uh, up to yours to get it out safely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. First we don't harm. <coughs> yeah. So blood pressure is fine. Uh, you can put the impella to P4. Yeah, and this can go fast, huh? this uh, yeah. es de-escalating. And what is your closure strategy? So you have your pre-closure, you got yeah. a, a Tie the knots, and then you're gonna make an angio at the end, or how do you assess your hemostasis? Well, in this case, um, I have still have the EBU in the aorta, so we could do a crossover to shoot an angio. Uh, um, in this case, I uh, would keep that as a bailout option and um, take the sheet out. So take the impeller out. Can you put it on P2? Hemodynamics remain completely stable. P2, Okido. And there's always a way of confirming patent hemostasis by ultrasound. Yeah, that's as uh, 
what I was about to say. We'll show that to you in a second. P1. Take the impeller across the valve. Some okay, so you'll s walk us through now. So when do you take out, at what P level is it safe to take out the impeller from the ventricle? Yeah, so now we put it on P1. That's the time I uh, remove it from the ventricle. So I just, uh, I just pull it back, voila. And then uh, go down, P0, take it out. I keep the sheet in. Take the impeller out, out. Kido. In the meantime, we will await the aortic pressure, the uh, ACT, I mean. Okay, we save the impeller. Any clots? No, no clots. No, that looks... Uh, oh, yeah. we solved the alarm. That's interesting. In the meantime, okay. ACT is still running? Yeah, both failed with the low block. Oh, okay. Well, ACT is 200. It's interesting. Anybody uh, would be willing to use protamine? Can I get the introducer and the terumo wire? So we gave a total of 7,500 units of heparin. And what is the antiplatelet uh, therapy? Aspirin and the clopidogrel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, for how long? The patient is on uh, NOAC because of his a a AFib, uh, so the idea would be to give him uh, uh, give him back his NOAC from dawn tomorrow or this evening if he's fine, and then uh, clopidogrel for six months. Yeah, but was the clopidogrel started today? Yes. Or was the patient already? Today, oh, okay. today. started today. Yeah. Uh, actually, just prior to the case. Yeah. So from from a theoretical or point of view, if you if the patient has been preloaded more than six hours prior to the procedure, I don't think there is too much of a concern with uh, with protamine. Oh, 350? That's interesting. Because we were at 220 an hour ago. Well, but you'll st you, can, you can always, so you have your safety wire on. You can, you can uh, yeah. close the knots and then uh, use an angio seal if needed on top of it. That's what I uh, was thinking, yeah. Let's do that. We'll see. Okay, good. So the wire is in. And if then there is some a, light, please. A residual ooze. Yeah. You can yeah. always consider. Exactly. No, and that's still the advantage of the uh, the proglides. Exactly. You keep the wire in. No, it's good, sir. So you also have three more minutes. Yeah. Let me quickly. I uh, think. Well, take your time. Make yeah. sure that uh, you complete all this successfully. Yeah, okay. Okay, keep the wire in, the sheet out, okay? Yes, of course. with the leash. Sorry. Yeah, that is the hectic ja getrokken wordt op dit even gevoelig. Ja, Okay. It's already looking promising. It's the first knot. Beetje geduw in gesprek, ja, dat is even vervelend. Nou, this looks uh, very good. Okay, I'll tighten the knots. Kido. Yeah, you can take the wire out. So I think we had several comments and questions from the audience and um, you know in our discussions among the panelists we already tackled almost all of them. So obviously there is no, um, f yeah, I mean you can definitely also try to, to do this procedure without uh, impella, particularly because the ejection fraction was 40% and it was a protected left main at the same time it really is part of our uh, of our practice in Erasmus to to have this additional safety of the of the mechanical support. Yeah. Um, okay. I think uh, no bleeding issues there. No major bleeding issues for no, sure. No, no, absolutely not. So we'll make an echo to uh, yeah to 
to confirm the patency yeah, yeah. of the vessel. Yeah. And so we are around the clock. We have uh, two, two more minutes, so well, let's, uh, let's complete this. Yeah, well, that's uh, perfect timing, I would say. Okay, do. So this looks nice color. This is the longitudinal view. Excellent. We will see an aneurysm in the superficial femoral, which was already there. So this is nice and patent. So we go to the common femoral. The side of the puncture looks fine. Here is the aneurysm with mm -hmm. flow. Yeah, I think you proved the point. Yeah, there is the profunda. Yeah. Nice. Here we are. Yeah. Very nice. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, Jost, uh, congratulations to you and uh, also the, the entire team. Also, uh, I think it's the last time that um, Alize Vermeer yeah. will be part of the live team. Uh, <laughs> team. So uh, thank you very much for, uh, for all the help, work, effort and energy that you gave us. And uh, good luck uh, in your career in the, in the pediatrics. So thank you very much for that. Okay, Joost, um, thank you. Any more final comments that you wanted to share with us before you uh, go off? No, um, thank you for watching. I think a challenging case, uh, a lot of learning points, a lot of things for discussion as, as, as usual during the live cases. And um, we hope it fulfilled the need of the course. Absolutely. Thank you. Great work. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Well, very With good. With that, we are coming to uh, the end of uh, this first uh, part of the TOMCS. So we will continue with a breakout session in five minutes. I'd like to thank our panel for great discussion. Uh, I'd also would like to thank again Joost and the entire team in the CAT Lab. Um, thank you, uh, Valeria. Thank you, Divaka. Thank you, uh, Holger. Also, you, the viewers, thank you very much for sticking with us. We'll be back in five minutes for the breakout session on escalation and de-escalation with mechanical circulatory support.